Welcome back to State of Decay 2 and my Lethal Builder run. Uh, I'm not in there yet because I want to see what people see when they get update 36. See a little message down here. Update 36 is live. We've got a collection of quality of life improvements. Um, so let's look at the updates menu and see what is in the game. So we've got, uh, so there's a bunch of stuff on here. And I think there's a few things that are most relevant to me and my playthrough right now. Uh, mostly it's depositing rucksacks at upgraded outposts. That is a thing that I couldn't do before that I might want to try doing now. Um, and they've also got some other, uh, they've added, when I say they, of course, I'm talking about Wushu Studios, who, um, is it Studios? Actually, I don't know what the suffix of their, of their studio is. It's Wushu. Wushu could be entertainment, could be, why don't I know the suffix of Wushu's company name? <laughs> I'm a garbage colleague. Okay, anyway, Wushu, they made this stuff. I don't know very much about it. I haven't experienced any of it yet. This is going to be my first view of update 36. So um, we are going to do an interview with Wushu next week. So uh, we'll be talking about it then. But by then, I want to have experienced it myself. So we're going to be going scavenging. We're going to be trying to drop rucksacks off at an upgraded outpost. We're going to be taking things from containers. We're going to be detaching attachments from weapons in our supply locker. It's going to be great. We're going to have a good time today. Um, I'm a little tired, didn't get a lot of uh, sleep last night, so I might be weird today, um, but what else is new? I should welcome folks in my chat. We got Ranathcord here, Paroxicus, uh, Cogs, Parker. It's good to have you all. And you know what I didn't do? I didn't tweet that I'm going to be uh, playing this game. So, okay. Anyway, I've just sent the tweet so people know I'm doing this. Uh, what the heck is going on? I'm playing as Ashley right now. Uh, she seems like she's in weirdly good condition, which means she must not have been who I was playing before. Oh, right. She's one of my new recruits. She's one of the booze hounds. Got it. Uh, I got her friend Rash killed. Or Rash got himself killed by running off without any cure. But let's have a look. Okay, so she, yeah, she is pff, woefully under-equipped. She's just carrying a bunch of booze around in her backpack. Let's get her into some better shape. Actually, let's have a look at what she's capable of. She's a close combat specialist. Cool. But she is a driver. That's nice, because I have been running myself out of fuel like crazy. And so if you've got the driving skill, your fuel efficiency is much better. I also, I've been playing a lot of uh, Pacific Drive lately, and my fuel efficiency in that game has been stressing me out quite a lot. Uh, I keep expanding the size of my fuel tank, but there's so many things that can go wrong. Your fuel tank can spring, spring a leak. There's actually a condition you can run into in Pacific Drive where your fuel is just constantly evaporating while you're in the level. Uh, and I, I actually got, I, I did an episode just on my own off the stream uh, where basically I was just like, I had no gas for a lot. I was just running around trying to siphon gas out of cars. It was great. So uh, I don't want to be in that kind of condition. So, okay, so she's got discipline. Decent cardio. So yeah, so close combat, that means that really it doesn't matter what weapon I give her. Because uh, I don't want to just have her run around just doing close combat. That sounds crazy. So I'll let her keep her drive shaft club. Um, drive shaft club, it just sounds like... That sounds like the fan club for that, um, that band from Lost uh, that had uh, Mariadoc as its... Uh, what, what was he, like the... Was he the singer or was he like the bassist or something? I don't remember. Anyway, um, okay, so let's grab, it's got a break on it. I want to grab something with that's nice and suppressed, but that also has ammo because <laughs> I'm out of everything. Okay, so this has got some ammo. Let's grab the Samurai SMG and let's try to find ourselves a suppressor. It's a compensator. That's a break. I tend to put breaks on my heavy ones. Ooh, okay. This one's got a handmade suppressor. The Debartini has a handmade suppressor. And notice, this is a brand new feature in Update 36. I can detach the mod from it in the supply locker. I don't have to first equip it over on my character, then detach the mod, then send it back. I can just hit RT, and the mod is gone. And then I can go all the way down to the bottom here and grab it wherever it is. I think it was a handmade. So yay! Now we've got a suppressor on that guy. Um, we don't have a lot of... I don't think we've got a lot of 9 mil. Lying, we've got 6 9 mil lying around. We have a ton of 357. So I'm wondering if maybe I should try to find a 357 gun. 
do I even have a 357? Maybe the reason I've got so much 357 is because I literally don't have a 357 anywhere. So let's let's unload some of these guns that have 9 mil in them at least. Give ourselves at least some backup ammo. And let's fire something that's not 9 mil. Got some got a 45. Yeah, let's grab this 45. I won't bring any extra ammo for it. It's just for backup anyway. Oh, that's got a professional suppressor on it though. Let's swap the mods on these two. Let's put the suppre the professional suppressor on the gun I intend to use the most. And then my backup gun I should get the crappier suppressor. Okay, great. Now, let's get her some consumables. Regular old health consumables. Some random fire. I guess snacks. Oh, let's not worry about snacks because we're, we're going to be trying to scavenge today. And so I want to leave a little bit of room in my backpack. Okay, so Cogs is suggesting that I should take at least one snack. Oh, okay. Hold on. I think there might be a bug that he's trying to highlight. Let's see. So, okay. I've got a snack. Uh, oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So taking one snack historically has been on the Y button. It's on the left trigger now. Okay, so this is actually one of the more complicated parts of the game underneath the hood. All of the crazy key mappings that go into th interfaces like this, like the inventory, where there, you can just do so many different things to each item, and each one is assigned to a different button. Um, it's really weird and arcane underneath the hood. And I would not be surprised if, while they were trying to put um, removing the attachment from a gun on RT on a gun, if they had to scramble some things around, and taking one of something ended up having to be on LT. But LT... Was it LT for, like... Was it... Okay, okay so now we're clicking the left stick to sort. Because I thought, I, thought, I thought that sorting... Yeah, I thought that sorting was on LT before. Maybe I was misremembering. So yeah, I guess they've moved it around. Huh. That's interesting. Tolo suggesting that in State of Decay 3 we should bring back the gla the Blaze of Glory move from State of Decay 1. That was a favorite. Yeah, and that's actually something a brand advocates for that all the time. That was one of his favorite things in State of Decay 1. And it was something that we, we intended to have in State of Decay 2. We just cut it for time, basically, was all we did. Um, Let's see here. So, yeah, I guess, you know, I will grab one snack. And I use the left trigger to do it. Uh... I imagine there's probably people out there for whom hitting Y is a is a well ingrained habit, and I imagine that for those folks it might be. What am I trying to do? I'm trying to hit the Y button. Of course, you see, you see what I was doing there. What I was trying to do is I was hitting the button from Hell Divers for picking up something off the ground. Uh, so I've already got some habit problems uh, <laughs> playing this game that have nothing to do with the update. Um, okay, so let's refuel the Impaler. So normally I'm careful, you know, driving these cars, or like I'm nervous about driving these cars, because you'll notice almost all of the cars here that I've got are like gas guzzlers. Um, but I'm normally worried about it, but because I've got this character who's a driver, they're going to be guzzling, half, guzzling gas at half the rate, which is great. Uh, so Boots' body is still over here, of course. I'm very sad about that. Um, but what I want to test out is the process of depositing rucksacks at an upgraded outpost. So this food outpost is upgraded. Is there anything near it that I really want to... Ooh, the fire department. And the pump house. Uh, so yeah, so... And we got materials here. Okay, so yeah, so there's there's a fair number of things. Not 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 the most important things in the world, but there's probably at least one useful rucksack in this fire firehouse because I've only searched one container and it could have a couple of different things and it's usually got a lot of them. So <laughs> Yes, La Coalition, I heard about the new edition of the Bible. 
that um, a former president is hawking. I don't usually get into political conversations on here. It does strike me as a little bit nakedly exploitative to try to raise money for your um, for your court fees by selling Bibles to people. But whatever, I'll leave it at that. I don't need to necessarily go into a lot of detail. I kind of, I feel actually almost like I have to apologize to people like La Coalition who are, oh wait, I just missed my turn off, like I do in real life. Um, people like La Coalition who do not live in the United States and yet have to constantly be exposed to all of our insane politics. Uh, because we're just getting, we're just getting dumber and dumber. And, <laughs> and more and more embarrassing. And, uh, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, at least for me, allegedly, I should be able to help do something about it. I should be able to, like, I don't know, vote for better people and stuff. Um, but you're just, like, you gotta listen to our nonsense all the time, and, uh, you're helpless, and I feel very guilty about that. Okay, I keep wanting to glance at the chat, but I just know, I know I'm going to hit a bloater if I do. So where am I exactly? Oh, I'm going completely the wrong direction. Of course I am. That's how I, that's how I roll. That is literally how I roll. Okay, so the thing I don't want to do is kill a bunch of zombies near these play cards. That would be a bad move. Now, I mean, eventually I do have to fight the play cards, but, um... After losing boots and <laughs> all of this other terrible stuff that's happening uh, to my characters, I feel like I, I don't trust myself to do something as challenging as go after a play card. I think I think I might need to be a little unambitious today. There's suddenly so many of you. I love it. I came in here and I was like, oh, wow, there's almost no zombies here. This is amazing. And then suddenly, just like, I didn't have to do very much. Although I saw that guy going after me. Okay, maybe bringing a character who was um, not powerhouse... to try and swing a big heavy drive shaft at everybody wasn't the best move. What? Cut it out. Okay, I've avoided a couple of pretty deadly bites, which is making me feel good because traditionally that's the thing that screws me over. Okay, actually, okay, so new zombies are gonna be going to where the screamer was. If I'm out of sight of where the screamer was, I might be okay. Okay, just wait a minute. What was the... Am I losing my mind? I've... Oh, there it was. Yeah, sorry. I just, I've, again, I've been playing so much Helldivers. I've just forgotten the controls for State of Decay. I was like, how do you turn on your flashlight again? I was remembering the old controls from before Juggernaut. There we go. That's what I'm looking for. I've been having a serious meds shortage and like, and at the end of last episode, I lost like three rucksacks of meds to me wanting to be cute. And, uh, cause I'd left them lying around thinking, oh, it'll be really cute if I remember these at the last minute and, you know, and was dumb and wasted a bunch of characters lives trying to get meds I didn't need. Uh, but then I literally did need those meds because the ones that I had collected were actually, they, they got culled. And I just, I could not believe that that's what happened. Because in my head, I thought that when I had talked with programmers about how rucksacks worked, I could have sworn we decided that rucksacks would be cold after a certain number were dropped on the ground. That they wouldn't be cold based on time. They would be cold based on rucksacks. You know, because the reason to cull rucksacks from the world is so there's not too many rucksacks. So you don't know, let players like fill up the world with rucksacks and, and tank their own performance 
accidentally, not knowing how they did it. You know, you want to make sure that there's a limit to how much random extra crap they can add into the world. Like, I remember that when I was uh, younger, before I was a game developer, I would play the original Halo with my friends, and one of our favorite things to do was stand there and smack a dead grunt in the face again and again and again until the it, there were so many blood decals on the ground that uh, the game just ground to a halt, became a slideshow. We just thought that was really funny, but you don't actually want to let players do stuff like that. So we so we call rucksacks because we don't want you to be able to do that. We don't want you to be able to mess up your own experience. But I thought we were going to call them based on how many rucksacks were actually in the world. You know, basically start calling them when you are actually filling the world with too many rucksacks, not call them based on time. And so the fact that those rucksacks disappeared when I didn't add any other rucksacks to the world took me completely by surprise. Okay, there's one container I'm missing. Oh, oh, it's up on the roof. Oh, okay, there it is. You can see that little icon up there. All right, well. Hmm. I would like not to tangle with these zombies if I can help it. Okay, we'll drop off the stuffs and then how do I get on that roof? I assume there must be a ladder in the back somewhere. Nope. Okay, so La Coalition has started a bet like he likes to do. Um, <laughs> so he's having people try to bet right now uh, on Twitch of whether I'm going to die, get fully infected, or blow up a car first. Uh, now, there's a decent chance, you know, I mean, nothing's impossible. I might do none of the above. I'm going to try really hard to do none of the above. Uh, so, you know, that is one of the options on there. So feel free to bet for none of the above if you're with me. That's what I would bet for. Um, but you know, I can't really prove that that's extremely likely. I mean, the past several, the past several games, past several episodes, I've believed that was what was going to happen and then got surprised. So anyway, so, okay. So I've got that meds rucksack. I also would like to, oh wait, there's a place back here. Ah, this. This is a separate site back here. So originally, we were going to try to set up State of Decay 2 so that you could have a site that had multiple buildings on it. In fact, you know, in the data under the hood, a site and a building are two different things, and buildings are always nested inside of sites. And what we thought we were going to do was have a big icon on the map that represented the fire station, but within the fire station, there could be two different icons, or maybe it wouldn't be icons, just two different buildings. The fire station itself and the uh, house out back. And a lot of these other locations, like, you know, um, a house that's got a garage or a shed or something, we would treat it like a single site with two different buildings in it. And we thought that sounded good until people started trying to actually build UX for the game. And when they did, they realized that actually that players were not going to be able to make any sense of that. Like, if there are two very different buildings that offer two very different things, but they're both under the same icon under the map, that gives the player no ability to actually research what they could be scavenging for in these places. So each building that offered something different had to be its own icon on the map. So we ended up taking this whole tree-like structure of, you know, you've got like a neighborhood, like you've got a region and then a neighborhood and then a site and then a building and then a room inside that building. Uh, we had this very complicated system. We ended up needing to make most of that invisible. So like regions don't exist as far as you're concerned. Buildings don't exist. Rooms don't really exist as far as you're concerned. It's just sites and neighborhoods. And neighborhoods only exist in that there are these titles that show up on the screen when you drive into certain areas. And that's it. That's the only thing neighborhoods do. That and occasionally a mission will reference the name of a neighborhood. It is very weird to get into a car and not have to turn the key and put it in gear manually after playing a lot of Pacific Drive. All right, so I think, oh yeah, usually I claim the ammo outpost here, but no, I've claimed the food outpost here. All right, well, we have got a rucksack. I'm not sure how you deposit a rucksack. I, I have not played Update 36 yet. 
So let's see. Oh, it's just a third option on the menu here. So if I've got a rucksack in my back, I can deposit rucksack. And now those materials are there. And, and it reminds you, so even if you don't have a rucksack on your back, the button is always there telling you it's a possibility. That's pretty user friendly, actually. I was, I was genuinely unsure what the right thing to do, like what the right user experience would be for that. That's pretty useful. Hey, players, uh, Wushu listened to you all, you know? I mean, you've been asking for this for ages. I never gave this to you. I kept making arguments about how we shouldn't. Um, but honestly, like, is it, I mean, does the game really break if we do this? No, it doesn't. It's fine. You can have all, like, it, it is one thing that is very, uh, that, that does game designers often need to realize is that you can have these very sort of grand ideals about how your game design is supposed to work and like and you kind of you want to design a system that is very balanced and very sort of aesthetically pleasing to think about where everything's in the right place and we had a design like that for how rucksacks work in the game you know there's certain rules about what can be deposited where and it felt like we had all the right motivations but in the end a lot of the time it's just i don't know what do players want to do is it okay maybe you should let them do it <laughs> So, uh, congrats to Wushu on uh, figuring out a very convenient thing to do. Now, what this means is I probably don't need to go home as often now. I don't need to go home to take my rucksacks home. Uh, and so it'll be interesting to see how my play patterns change and if I feel like they get better. It might just feel like they get better. Of course, this is the lethal zone. I do kind of feel like I want to go home fairly often just to get a break from the zombies. Not that they necessarily leave me alone when I go home, but they leave me more alone, I guess. I guess I just do feel a little bit safer. Uh, I don't feel safe at all with those guys wandering this way. So I'm going to go to this hardware store. That's not really putting me out of their range, but whatever. We'll do this. All right. So now I'm going to search this. And one thing I haven't been doing yet is looking for opportunities to take all of something. Um, so that was a rucksack. There is no take all. Let's let's try to keep our eyes open for stacks of things. Um, or for like multiple... Wait. Or is it actually... Ah, okay. So no, it's not taking all of a stack. That's that. We Of course, you already took all of a stack every time you, you took a stack. The take all option. You can see down at the bottom there, uh, if you hold the A button, you take all. Take all means take everything in the container, all the different stacks. So I'm going to hold A. And it all just goes away. And it's the same button I would normally press. Whoops. Same button I would normally press to take one thing. And it's just you hold the same button and you take all of the thing. That makes a lot of sense. Um, Paroxica says, nice. I hadn't seen that. Yeah. So, so a lot of, so the changes that they made in update 36, they're not like big dramatic new features that like alter the entire nature of the game. Okay, good. I was kind of hoping. Yes. They took a turn. They're going down the street that direction. So I, if I'm sneaky enough, don't need to tangle with them at all. But yeah, it's not like they added a whole bunch of really dramatic stuff to the game. They made some quality of life improvements, but sometimes that's exactly what you need. All right, so I think this accounting firm hasn't been ransacked yet. Oh, what, ooh, what's this? <laughs> Sinister Plank says, fun fact, you're in the exact same building I'm in right now. So I guess Sinister is, uh, is watching me play while playing the game, and we just happen to be doing the same thing. That's kind of fun. Uh-oh. Okay. This might attract some attention. I gotta watch the noise. Okay, nobody made any noise. No way. I can still hear the horde. Okay, now they're definitely coming. No more Mechanics textbook. Let's just get out of here quick. So we actually, I think... Oh! We actually spawn new zombies when you make noise like that. And it's something we've been sort of wondering about whether that's actually... I mean, so, in, oh, in State of Decay 2, one of the problems we face is the fact that most zombies don't exist at most times. 
like you know we we keep spawning and despawning zombies in basically a little ring around you i need to drop off a bunch of stuff here to make room in my inventory but yeah we spawn and despawn zombies in a little ring around you because we just can't afford to keep all the zombies tracked at all times you know we can track hordes across the map and occasional freaks we can keep track of but we're never going to be able to you know keep track of literally every zombie on the map so you have to constantly be spawning them and despawning them but what that means is if we're trying to do something like bring zombies when you make a loud noise hey way to waste your nine millimeter If we're going to do something like have a bunch of zombies, you know, react to you making a loud noise, we can't guarantee that there will be zombies nearby or that we'll even know where the zombies are supposed to be. And so we did what you often do in video games, which was we took a shortcut. And we basically said, if you make noise, we just pretend there were zombies nearby a lot of the time and just spawn new ones. Because honestly, spawning new zombies, yeah, that is a little bit cheap, but also it's no cheaper than what's happening all the time. Like, most zombies you meet in the game were spawned 10 seconds earlier. Um, and so it's not actually that different to spawn a zombie because you made a noise just then. So that's what we do. And so, yeah, so when I'm running around, you know, making all that noise, not only did I actually bring that horde down on me, but I even created some of those zombies that attacked. I mean, I think that bloater horde was probably spawned entirely because I made that noise and not because it was already there. Yeah, Sinister Plank says, yeah, so one of the advantages of that strategy is that, you know, fast searching is always a gamble, even if you've cleared the area. And that's true. And so, yeah, but the question there that, that we have to ask ourselves is, and, and again, I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer to this. So probably this is, this is one of those, like, just sort of aesthetic preference choices. Um, is it better to always have that action be a risk or is it better to reward players for planning ahead and, and clearing out all the zombies before searching? Like, should players be able to consciously search out all the zombies, clear them all out, and then search rapidly and not care that they're making noises? because they know they've already done their due diligence, you know, and cleared the zombies out. Like, you could definitely make an argument that that's the better player experience. I think that that one might have, have a container on the roof as well. We'll have to go look. So Sinister says, just clearing an area of walking zombies is one thing, but you don't know if you've got zombies sleeping under a pile of trash or something. That is true, and that's actually kind of what we could probably say we're, we're trying to simulate. We have zombies just sort of come out of the woodwork. Is that, you know, it's a very common thing in zombie media to have zombies, you know, be hanging out in like really surprising places where, you know, you think you've cleared a place, but you're never quite sure you've cleared the place. That is kind of what that represents. And so it, it does fit in with the zombie canon. It's not like we're doing something crazy that, that, that violates, you know, everyone's expectations. You do kind of expect zombies to be able to show up at inopportune times because that's what they do in The Walking Dead, right? They try to just like, they, they consciously try to interrupt random scenes with a zombie showing up out of nowhere and just murdering someone. But Cog says, and that's why I don't watch zombie media. I mean, yeah, so there's definitely, there can be a sort of cheapness to deaths sometimes. Like, you know, you could definitely make an argument that death in the real world is often very surprising, you know, and, and it can just, it could just hit you out of nowhere you had no idea it was going to happen or, or, or whatever. And, and just that's it. Sudden tragedy. And that totally happens in the real world. And, you know, dealing with that kind of thing thematically within a story does make sense. But also, one of the reasons we go to stories is to experience a version of reality that has more meaning, like intrinsically imbued into it than reality actually gets. You know, I mean... That, that is what we do a lot as human beings. You know, we try 
to put meaning into things that don't necessarily come with the meaning, you know, ready made. And one of the things that really makes stories entertaining and fun is the fact that the author puts meaning into it. They do things for a purpose. They are intentionally sort of, you know, setting things up and paying them off and, and, and making the experience satisfying in a way that is difficult for, for reality to be satisfied. And so trying to replicate the randomness of life, it can if that is the point of your story, it's what people are coming to you for, sure, it can it can be just as good as anything else. But it's not crazy for people to actually want the deaths in their fictional stories to have more meaning and to have more sort of intentionality to them than the deaths that you and, and more sort of like emotional preparation around them, a more, you know, sort of support for the experience than, than you often get uh, from real life. Um, and then it's also possible too for, I mean, uh, I think w one really good example of this is um, Tony Almeida in 24. Spoilers. Um, I think it's like season four or five or something of 24. Um, they just kill one of the characters who's been there from the very beginning. Like, like he originally was like, you know, you're, you're the original, like in the first episode, you meant you're meant to be suspicious of him. And then you very quickly find out that actually he's super reliable and super cool. Um, and eventually they tried to turn him into a bad guy in one of the much later seasons, whatever. I don't know it, it but but they they had this one scene uh, I think in I can't remember what season it was in where they just just kill him out of the blue. It's like there was no preparation, no setup, no it is just like oh and now Tony's dead and you're just like what? And, and and what you you get the sense that what they were doing was playing like an arms race with the audience where it's like the they wanted to do things that the audience wouldn't have predicted. Um you know, like they wanted to do something that that just like wouldn't have been on Reddit or something like that prior to prior to the episode coming out. Um, and you kind of get a sense that that's like what they might have been doing on Lost as well is like trying to outsmart the audience, trying to like sort of win the contest where it's like, you know, because there are some audience members who treat who who treat like watching a TV show or movie like it's a contest, like it's a, like it's a sort of, mi like it's a mystery solving contest, like 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 they are, um, Columbo, you know, and and the writers are the criminal, and they and, and you know and they win if they figure out what's happening before the writers officially reveal it. And so there's, and that's a weird attitude for audience members to have. And sometimes they'll, you know, talk negatively about the show if it's, you know, if they're too able to see what's coming. Um, but you end up with, you know, I think writers sometimes getting insecure about that. And then, and sometimes twisting and warping their shows just to make them unpredictable. When sometimes, you know, doing something that's utterly unpredictable, I mean, it might win that contest with the audience. But it doesn't actually necessarily make the story good. You know, doing the thing that you were actually... Like, if you spend three seasons setting up an idea, but then the audience gets it, it doesn't make the story better f for you to just then take take a, you know, a hard left turn and do something completely different from what you were setting up so that it's unpredictable for the audience. Um, that, that doesn't make it good. Um, I mean, yeah, if you're, you know... You could be sad and you could take some criticism from the audience for, for the fact that, you know, that they saw it coming. And that might not be, you know, the most fun experience, but doing something random that wasn't set up in the story just to shock people, that doesn't make your story better. That, that, that makes your story worse a lot of the time. So that's how I felt about, you know, Tony Almeida's death, um, his apparent death that was then undone later also as a surprise um you know like that's how i felt about that that there's been other times in shows too where i was like oh they just wanted to surprise me they're not actually trying to tell a satisfying story anymore sinister plank points out that actually you know as much as they might make fun of you or something if they think that your thing was too predictable those audience members whoa oh, okay hi hi everybody those audience members who figured it out, like having it go the way they expected it to, is a is a prize. 
I mean, that is what they're actually trying to do. They want to figure it out. And so if you if you let them be successful, that actually can be a good payoff for them. And you know, as a creator, you are there to serve your audience. You know, like, yeah, you've got your own artistic ambitions too, but ultimately you're making the thing so that people can enjoy it. So you will have a certain emotional experience that you're going for with them. And that makes you, that makes them, they are your customer. You are, you know, um, you are, you know, there to, to entertain them. And so like, so it's all right. Even if they're a little, even if they're a little snide about it, you are successful if you make them, if you make them feel good. If you make them feel good about the thing you created. All right. We got some zombies being freaking weirdos over here. What was that about? Hey, dummies. All right. So, there was a feral. I ran over here to get on my car to get away from the feral. I still want to loot that house? Yeah, the fact that she is not a powerhouse specialist makes using this weapon kind of a poor choice. We deliberately made it... So originally the powerhouse skill... It didn't have a lot going for it. You had this one wrestling move you could do that was kind of cool, but that was a little bit of it. Originally, the powerhouse skill was intended to be our heavy weapons skill. And then when we cut heavy weapons from the game prior to release, it kind of lost a lot of its purpose. And so when we did finally add the heavy weapons back into the game, as we always intended, you know, we gave them back to powerhouse. Uh, and we wanted powerhouse to be meaningful. And so we basically made it so that Heavy weapons are just garbage. Whoa, there! That's where he went. Hi. Okay. He was just hanging out in there. Holy cow. Come here. Get on my spikes. There we go. Ugh. What was I talking about a second ago? I completely forgot that came out of nowhere. Oh, stop it. Oh, right, powerhouse. Um, whew, so anyway, so we made powerhouse. Basically, it's garbage to try to swing this weapon. It takes almost all of your stamina to swing it a couple of times if you don't have the powerhouse skill. Uh, but if you do have the powerhouse skill, then it becomes much more manageable. So, like, blades and blunt weapons, they work okay regardless of what your skills are. Um, they're just kind of fine, you know, no matter what. Uh, they get some special abilities if you do have the dedicated skills, but it's not like there's a problem swinging them uh, if you don't have those skills. Heavy weapons, though, there's a problem. And I actually, I really should have given this character a different weapon. Sinister Plank says that he uh, chugs Red Bull. Uh, the you know he <laughs> uses energy drinks whenever he's swinging one of these things. That makes it yeah. So I think I've been struggling to keep up with like energy drinks and stuff like that in the Lethal Zone just because resources are so scarce. But yeah, that is a strategy. Uh oh, I hear someone who needs a helping hand. Somebody needs some help, but this character is getting very tired. And I think maybe she'll actually go home. Yeah, I've been doing this for like 40 minutes. All right. Is that everything? Yes, that was everything in the house. I think we're ready to go home. Okay, so look at this. I'm going home. Right? Like, this is... Oh, there's one item left in there. Let's go get that. This actually, I mean, I, I still don't really know what the long-term effect of 
the change to rucksacks uh, is going to be. But this does kind of illustrate something to me that feels like, you know, like a challenge that game designers have to sort of deal with. Which is that, you know, a big part of your job is imagining what players are going to do and, and anticipating problems and sort of guessing, you know, what is it that players are going to want to do? What are the exploits they're going to find? What are the... Oh. Whatever. What are the you know parts of the game that are going to be a problem that you have to fix in advance? You know you don't want to ship the game with something that's going to make it less fun. Um, and so you're trying to think ahead all the time. And sometimes it's really easy to really get obsessed with some potential player problem that is actually not going to be a real problem. So I don't know if this is going to be an example of that or not. We haven't really seen my, my long, what my long-term play patterns are going to be like. But when we were early, like you know, before release on State of Decay 2, there was this theory going around that players had no reason to go home. And that players were basically going to spend all of their time away and they were never, ever, ever going to return to their base. And that was, I mean, we didn't have extensive playtesting data because we didn't have extensive numbers of players. Um, by the way, notice I've done all of this on one tank of gas, uh, which only this character can pull off. Uh, but anyway, um, but it was sort of, it's sort of a guess. We're like, oh man, what if players never ever come home and, and they just don't get that sense of community. They don't, they don't get that sense of look of pride in their base and stuff like that. Cause they're literally never there. We need to make sure we give them a reason why they're forced to go home. Now it'll be interesting to see now that, that the mechanism that we came up with, which was let's, you know, basically say that rucksacks can only be delivered at home. Now that that's not the way it always works, and players are no longer limited that way, I'm really curious to see if players really do never go home. Like, are we gonna are we gonna find out that we were right about that? And that, yeah, that players just never go home and that in some way or another, their experience with the game gets worse because they never go home. Even if they don't, even if they don't like, you know, uh, fully recognize that or, or like feel that as a problem while they're experiencing it, like it, it could easily be that they have a worse experience because of that. But it's also at least as likely that this is fine, that maybe they go home 20% less because they can drop rucksacks off and it doesn't have any kind of meaningful in impact on their experience at all. And we were being excessively paranoid about that when we made this decision. That is, I consider that to be every bit as likely an outcome, if not more so. So it, it'll be very interesting to see how this goes, to see if, 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 if you know, if, if we actually see the play patterns that we were hedging around, or if we just see that, oh yeah, no, this is just no big deal. Let's give her the chop up. Okay, looks like we already dealt with all these guys. That's great. Oh, there's one more. But are they... Are they inside a rock? We've got a... we got a zombie inside a rock. Oh, uh, whatever. <laughs> but yeah, like, you know... I still hear, you know, one, one, one other idea, for instance, sometimes people make is, sometimes people will make the opposite argument, actually, where they'll be like, um, what if, why should the player ever leave base? They're safe there. You know, what if they just decide to sit there and never go out? And I'm like, that sounds like the most boring player I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> like, you know, like one of the reasons why, you know, our, our base, like, uh, when you look at your resources... You know, we make sure that there are these constant resource decrements. Actually, I need to make sure that I need to try to bump up my food again. There's these constant resource decrements. One of the reasons for that is we need you to leave the base. We need you to go out and put yourself in danger. And giving you resource decrements is a way to make sure that you do that. But at some point, somebody, you know, actually said out loud, what if the player just sits at home all the time and never does anything? That won't be any fun. I'm like, that's true. So they'll leave the base. <laughs> They're like, yeah, if they're sitting home at the base and and they're not having fun 
and leaving the base would be fun. Guess what they're going to do? They're going to leave the base. That's what they're going to do. Like, I don't think we need to be afraid that players are going to literally never leave the base. They'll just go play a different game if they don't want to leave the base. Like, like, and yeah, sure. You know, if we make leaving the base so scary that no one feels like they can handle it, then yeah, p players might just play another game rather than take on the stress of playing this. But I don't know. I just, I feel, I feel like that was just a little bit of an overblown concern. I mean, I do... It's more representative of a broader question. Like, does the player feel like they're motivated to do particular things? Because that can be a fear. Um, and I think that's a more legitimate way to frame the problem. It's like, if you're looking at the map and, and just like, yeah, I could do lots of things, but none of them seem particularly useful. Like, I don't have a problem to solve. It's just, I could just kind of go out, I guess. That is a problem. If we don't make you feel like there are, there are specific worthwhile goals for you to pursue outside your base, we have broken something. But I don't think it necessarily needs to have like you know a, a punishing uh, thing like like where it's like oh if you stay at home bad things will happen. I think you can also motivate players positively, saying like oh if you go out here good things will happen. That's also a good way to handle it. Um, and so State of Decay Two has a lot of negative motivations where what you're trying to do is avoid the stick rather than chase the carrot. And I feel like there are there are ways we could have designed the game that were more carrot and less stick. Um, that still feel like it's a survival game, but that feel like you can sort of tip the balance more towards fulfilling your ambitions and less towards running away from negative consequences. Anyway, uh, I've been playing with this character for a while. She needs a break. I need a little bit of a break. Let's have a look at the chat. Cog says, uh, staying at base isn't boring. It's surviving the aftermath, referencing the game that's called surviving the aftermath. I mean, that's so, well, the thing is to make staying home all the time interesting, you have to have a home simulation that is as complicated as surviving the aftermath. The home simulation we have in State of Decay 2 is specifically designed so that you have a few decisions to make at home, but then the next thing you need to do is leave. Uh, and go out and have adventures. Because State of Decay 2 is primarily about living in the zombie apocalypse, and it's secondarily about managing the zombie apocalypse. Whereas Surviving the Apocalypse, or whatever it was called, yeah, Surviving the Aftermath, is about managing the aftermath. That's what it's about. Uh, it's not about living in it at all. And so so they don't have to strike the same balance. They need to make their base management as interesting and, 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 you know, and the right amount of complexity to keep you engaged in that exclusively whereas we need to make a version of that where it's interesting while you're engaging with it but then you could turn away from it and and it works okay like the, the whole base doesn't just collapse because you stop paying attention because uh because our players as a general rule want to be able to stop paying attention to their base for a while to go get in trouble with zombies like that's a huge part of the experience so the coalition says remember the bet that we made oh yeah that's true so so who um who won <laughs> Because none of the bad things that you call that happened. I didn't blow up a car. I didn't get infected. I didn't get killed. So it looks like it was none of the above. Did somebody win because we got none of the above? Oh, Coalition is also reminding me that I need to turn on the water here. I'll do that. I'll do that in just a minute. Because I want to do another episode after this one. Um, I just want to read a little bit more chat first. Oh, so Cogs wants to know, and actually he says that Ranathcourt actually originally asked this question earlier on. Why did Wushu decide not to run the patch through the PTR? The PTR are a public test realm, which is our, you know, sort of alternate branch on Steam where you can try out stuff before it's ready for prime time. Um, he, uh, the official email said that they were going to put spawn changes in the PTR soon, just not uh, enough big stuff in this update to necessitate, to necessitate the extra eyes on it. Uh, yeah, I think that's what it is. I mean, the, the only thing I guess they probably could learn from the PTR is like tuning in because they made some changes to the black heart. Theoretically, they could run that by some players and, you know, and, and, and see how people reacted to that. And also theoretically, you could sort of test people's play patterns in response to having the ability to deposit rucks, deposit rucksacks. Um, but it's all that's all very kind of nebulous, high level stuff. Um, and I think that, you know, they already got so much feedback back, especially about the Black Heart. They already know so much from the feedback they already have about what players problems were, what, what the big pain points were by how much, you know, that I think that, that I think they probably just felt confident that they could tune with the information that they had. I'm not I mean, I can't speak for them. I didn't ask them this question myself. But that's what my assumption is, because, you know, having been in the same position, sometimes you know the problem well enough that you feel pretty confident 
that you can just sort of run with it. But there are some other things that are a little bit fluffier where they're like, I don't know, is this better? Who can tell? Uh, like some of the spawn changes that they're working on where you're putting that in the public test realm really will give them, like this is something that they haven't been asking you questions about. They didn't already put new spawn changes in front of you and get your reaction to it. And now they're following up with some quality of life changes. They haven't touched the spawning at all, uh, in, in at least in, in a lot of ways. And so, you know, they don't, I think they aren't running with a lot of existing information that they've already gotten from the audience. So that's an area where I can totally see them wanting to be like, yeah, the only way we'll know if this is working because the spawning is so random that, you know, you can make a change and then play for five hours and not even know whether your change made a difference because it was random anyway. And there's so much variability between, you know, uh, different you know instances of spawning. How do you even know if you tuned it well, right? You need to get some much broader feedback on that. So, so yeah, I, I imagine they're probably thinking of the PTR as being like most valuable for that kind of change. And these quality of life changes that are mostly either just very straightforward UX improvements or follow-ups to feedback they've already gotten from players, that just probably just didn't feel like it was as important uh, to, to test that way. All right, let's see here. Yeah, Sinister Blank was making about the same suggestion. Um, and let's see here. Oh, hey, Jawa Fawa's in here. I didn't see that he was playing with us. Oh, yeah, he was uh, celebrating my use of a Molotov a little bit earlier on. And then he points out that there's a lot of players, uh, you know, we, we were worrying about players not going home because of rucksacks. He's like, so there's some players who don't go home anyway. Like, you know, even if they, you know, have a bunch of rucksacks in their trunk, they'll just still stay out and just keep fighting plague hearts and do it all sorts of stuff. Like players who are here for the action specifically, there's nothing we can do to make them come home regularly. <laughs> and that's, you know, and if that's how they want to play, if they're enjoying the game that way, like who are we to tell them they're doing it wrong, right? Okay, so Le Coalition says that uh, the bet that he set up was for the entire stream, not just for the episode. So maybe we'll continue that bet uh, as we keep going. Except did I just mess it up by telling you late that I was going to start a new episode? I don't know. Anyway. Yeah, so Cogs, Cogs is asserting that moving the take one button from Y to LT is just a straight up mistake. Uh, I, I mean... They're not. It's not in the patch notes. So there are a couple of possibilities here. One is uh, that that it literally was a mistake that they actually moved it by accident while they were moving something else. That's entirely possible, and just no one called it out. That's not a crazy thing to to guess. Another option might just be yeah that somebody you know they had to move it in order to implement something else, and just figured that that would be fine and everyone would accept it. You know, um, because whatever they added was uh was was really important the thing is because of how arcane this stuff is like the button mapping stuff that how arcane it is under the surface it's possible for them to know they had to move that button but for it not to be obvious to you why they had to move it uh that's the kind of thing you might actually have to explain in a patch note so people understand what the trade-off was uh because otherwise you have players going like why did you move my button um, there's no clear, obvious reason why you did it, and it just annoys players. <laughs> but that's it. We, we've, uh, I've run into that kind of thing with State of Decay 2 before as well, making changes that seemed obvious to me, that everyone's like, why is it working like that? That that doesn't make any freaking sense. Uh, Reginelli, I never answer questions about weather anymore. That's just, that's just, we've, I've, I've, I've tackled it too many times. Um... Yeah, so Cogs points out that he can't remap uh, the keys uh, the way he wants to. And that, I think that might be true. I think that we might have either no remapping options for some of those inventory options because there's just so freaking many of them. Um, and another possibility might be that we do have the ability to remap them, but they're all, they've all been abstracted in a weird way where it's like buttons one through four from menus. And if you changed it, you'd actually change about five different things. It would have these cascading effects that would actually break the game more. Uh, and so so I think Cogs is probably right that he, he might not have any recourse there. Partly just because we, when we originally implemented a lot of these UI interfaces, like we, I realize that was a redundant word, whatever. Um, we weren't planning on key mapping. Key mapping was a problem we were going to solve later. And as a result, we set up a lot of stuff that like after we started having to implement key mapping, it became a nightmare. And so one thing that I that I, I believe that our UX team is thinking about now on State of Decay 3 is this stuff has to be remappable. <laughs> you know, we have to try to make choices in these settings that are 
more simple and straightforward so that we can just, you know, put, just put things in a simple key mapping grid instead of having so many overlapping, weird crisscrossing connections between one button and another where it's like the same you know, button mapping does three different things on three different menus. So if you change one of them, you have to change all three of them, but that's unpredictable. And there's a clash or a conflict on one menu, but not on the other two. Like, uh, and I ran into this um, when I was playing uh, Starfield. I tried to move my jump button to A and my interrupt button to Y. And eventually I had to move it back because there were multiple menus where where it was just like, no, we are not prepared for that. That has a collision that we can't resolve. Um and so I just had to get used to jumping with Y, which is just insane to me. Uh, and then and then I got so used to it, I started trying to jump with Y in other games. The same way I've been trying to press the A button to interact in this game, uh, because that's what you do in Helldivers. Um, it's just, I don't know. That's It's complicated, but I think we can learn, at least learn from our mistakes. I don't, I think that the stuff under the surface cogs is so complicated, I would not be surprised if it's actually very very difficult to resolve the issue that you're raising uh, i don't know i wasn't on the ground making it but i'm i'm guessing that might actually be kind of challenging um but i think we can do a better job in standard k3 of making this stuff more remappable especially just for the sake of accessibility that's such a priority for us this time around like um we really you know i, I would be surprised if we don't do a better job uh, all right, I'm pretty sure I put your name in the game. Yes, uh, I, I think I have a memory of that because I remember, like, yeah, like, because I couldn't put Mad Max in the game, right? And so we had to talk through like what else to do. And actually, and I was lucky because I had the Norwegian immigrant name list, uh, and so and so I, I so put Ra in that list, and so I was like really excited that that, that worked. So yeah, your name is in the game. Um, okay, so you know what. I've been blathering here for a long time. Now it's been almost an hour since I got started. We should wrap this up. So I'm going to do another episode. That episode is going to go there. You can also subscribe to my channel and do all of that nice stuff. And we'll continue this conversation in the next episode.